Thanks for joining us for episode number 38 of the Calcedon podcast. I'm Andrea Schwartz, and today is September 24th, 2023. Calcedon President Mark Rush Dooney and Calcedon Vice President Martin Sobretti are joining me this evening for our discussion. Romans 6.23 states emphatically, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death is the outcome for individuals and cultures that are not in covenant with the triune God. However death occurs, those outside of Christ will forfeit what is promised when obedience or faithfulness are absent from the equation. We are all familiar with the tragedy of suicide in individuals. However, God's wrath, as has been demonstrated in history, also applies to cultures. And the death of a culture is much more like a suicide than anything else. And that is the subject of our discussion, based on an essay by by R.J. Rushduni written in December of 1973 entitled Suicidal Humanism. Mark, let's start with you. Sinful man, and by extension, sinful cultures, will often turn to religion to solve the problems they face. But... Beginning with Sigmund Freud and his philosophy, religion was viewed as something to be eliminated once the subject of guilt could be viewed not as the result of sin, but in terms of a medical problem explained in terms of social evolution. What happens when people accept an incorrect cause as they attempt to solve problems? Well, we've all heard stories about people with a medical condition that was misdiagnosed. And sometimes this misdiagnosis can go on for months or even years. And sometimes by the time they figure out what's wrong, the patient is is beyond saving. And that's a very uh, sad situation. So if your, your assumptions that your problem is one thing and it's not, you're not really treating treating the root cause. And scripture says our root cause is sin. It's rebellion against God. It's refusing to to bow the need, the the need to our creator as Lord. And so when man goes his own way, nothing's going to work out. And when man decides his problem is other than what God has defined it as, he has no hope. It's like treating a medical condition with the wrong medicine, the wrong treatment. And periodically, you'll even hear stories where a particular ailment was treated and it was actually the opposite of what was needed. And that's what our culture is really doing. It's treating a problem with something that's compounding the problem, making it far worse. And this is why our our culture is in trouble. And this is why our culture is in such a state of disrepair, and even collapse. And so it's correct to call this suicide because it's self-imposed. If suicide is self-murder, man, even though he thinks he's on a healing program, is actually furthering his own self-destruction. We should add that uh, in terms of uh, bad diagnoses, men know that cultures die, that empires collapse. And so they've put forward models for why this happens. Uh, One of the popular ones is the ballistic model, like you fire a a cannon and the ball goes up, it's got the rise of the Roman Empire, and then it's at its high point, and then finally the fall of the Roman Empire, as if it's just a mechanical process that's built in, baked into the equations of how cultures and empires behave. There's another one, kind of like a biological model. They talk about the birth of a culture, and then it's uh, youth, and then it's adolescence, and then it's adulthood, and it's senescence, and finally, it's decrepitude, and it's death. It's a, so it's, it's a natural process, and each of these things is wrong. All of these diagnoses are incorrect. Cultures and nations survive on a covenantal basis. Their relationship with God determines their status, uh, whether they're sailing high and enjoying tremendous blessings that, say, we would find in Deuteronomy 8 or Deuteronomy 28, or if they're collapsing because uh, they have sinned a great sin against God, and God is simply giving them a belly full of what they've essentially contracted for themselves. 
So a covenantal model is the only one that actually works. But just like in medicine, you have different models of what causes a disease. So too, in sociology, you have these different models or diagnoses of why cultures fall apart. And so what they try to do is treat these symptoms. Well, maybe we can continue to boost something up so it doesn't fall if it's the ballistic model that's in view. Or maybe we can uh, give life-enhancing and lengthening measures so that a culture doesn't die uh, uh, and doesn't fall apart like a human being would eventually. But all these are false solutions because we have, uh, what Mark says, is a false diagnosis. And the tragedy of it is that a correct diagnosis might have actually availed something for each of these cultures, but instead uh, they went in a different direction. And I think that's probably why, Andre, you mentioned Dr. Sigmund Freud here at this point, because there was an indicator inside the heart of man, inside his, the heart of hearts, that there was something wrong. Guilt was kind of a beacon going out, telling man there's something really wrong here, and it starts with myself and then goes out into culture. And what uh, Siegfried, uh, Sigmund Freud was trying to do was to turn off that beacon and say, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, this is simply a, a false beacon. It's not the truth. The guilt is not a true thing because there is no category of shame, guilt, right or wrong. Uh, and therefore, Freud sought to get rid of the problem by expunging it, as we say, uh, saying there isn't, it's, it's, a re- it's not a real thing. But guilt is a real thing. It's actually pointing to the heart's reaction to its own violations of God's law because the work of the law is written on God's heart. So uh, when you have people actually hiding the symptoms like Freud was doing and others are doing, then we get even farther away from a a good diagnosis and at the same time, a, a good resolution of the problem. Okay, so to follow through with that idea. Um, we hear about a world beyond good and evil. Is that even possible? Can you have a world beyond good and evil? Or are we just getting substitutionary definitions for good and evil? I think that's exactly the point. When you say that, you're saying we can set aside categories of good and evil and simply ignore them. And this creates this world beyond good and evil. And therefore, we have to inculcate and indoctrinate children to accept the fact that right and wrong are such situational Uh, categories only and uh, have no absolute value. They're not absolutes, they're relative. And if they're relative, then they're subject to change and manipulation by man. And if so, then man's in control of what's good and bad, right and wrong. So Nietzsche's claim to be living, uh, have us live beyond good and evil, which has been reiterated by others um, uh, in the afterwards, Skinner and whatnot, uh, is exactly that, is to say the, the categories of good and evil that we seem to be fighting as humanists are the biblical ones. So to say we're going on beyond good and evil is to say we're going beyond biblical definitions to humanistic ones that are malleable, plastic, and subject to man's manipulation and control. And if man can control it, then man can, is in control of everything. But if God's in control, then man's control is a farce, is a facade, is a fiction, and it will end up being a suicidal farce. Okay. Mark, your dad pointed out in the essay that when man relies on technology to solve his problems, his problems are only intensified and aggravated. Why is this so? Because uh, saying our problems are technical avoids what they truly are, and the Bible presents our problem is essentially moral, that man is rebel against God, and he's a sinner. He rebels against his creator and his creator's law. And my father used the term humanism quite frequently. If you um, think of an authority structure, humanism is when you remove uh, God in the supernatural Rome entirely from your thinking, and the, it assumes that the highest form of being is man. That that only leaves you man, and some would throw in aliens there just for the fun of it. But essentially, it leaves man in charge, and therefore that gives man a de facto authority, a de facto position that he does not have in a. Cr- Christian or biblical worldview. And so man has a moral problem, according to the Bible. And as long as you're misdiagnosing the problem as just a technical one, you have to remember, too, where does God come into view for an evolutionary view of man's history? 
if you accept an evolutionary view of man's history, God is an imposter to this universe. He is a fabrication, a mythology that man has created because that mythology filled a, a need for man. But since Darwin, we've had this idea that the universe existed from it has always existed physically in some form, and that uh, everything we are today, everything we see around us, is really only a product of the physical nature of a being that is essentially, or, or of, a, of a universe that's essentially eternal. They eternalize time, space, and matter, say it always was. That's the only thing that has these attributes, is our own universe. And therefore, what is religion? What is God? God is something, they say, that was created by man. And so they are assuming, when they speak of religion, that it's an artificial construct. And so if it's an artificial construct, they have every justification in their own minds for saying it's not going to be necessary permanently. From And also disassociating themselves from any religious uh, explanation of the world, refusing to believe in the supernatural or to use it to explain man's problem. And so they're left with a rather mechanistic universe. And therefore, they say, well, now we've achieved such an understanding of what the universe really is since Darwin. Now we only have to find the solutions that lie within the universe itself. So they can see this idea of technology. And this was an even bigger idea in the mid 20th century when things were, they, there weren't so many negatives in our culture as there are today. And uh, John F. Kennedy actually once saying that our problems today are largely just technical ones. In other words, we're on the right track. We're on the ascendancy. All we have to do is solve things. And so we advance in medical, we advance in technology, we advance in computer sciences, et cetera. And man thinks that he's on the right road to controlling everything. And yet, morally, our situation only gets worse. Our culture is really falling apart and people bemoan that we don't live in the moral the universe that we once did, the social universe that we did just a generation or two ago, it's because it's falling apart and is destroying what centuries of Christendom built up. And that's why my father created this idea that our our, our answer in response to this suicidal humanism is Christian reconstruction. It's just start doing what God says. We start with ourselves, we start with our families, and we work outward to our vocations and our various spheres of influence. But we have to start obeying God to rebuild a foundation based upon something that's real. And what is real is that God says, thou shalt not, or things will go badly for you. And we're proving day by day, year by year, that when we disobey God and we defy his law, things go badly. And it's interesting when men allege that the problems are technological. Now, this is their frame for all things that they propose now to fix. As Mark alluded to, the mid-20th century was like this. Most of the 20th century had this frame. The very first easy chair, I believe, that uh, Dr. Reshtuni recorded, he spoke about the Dust Bowl. And uh, modern science tells us, well, the problem with the Dust Bowl was we had a drought and we had bad agricultural practice. And so if you would just uh, at least do something about that agricultural practice, we'll solve the problem. But now from a biblical point of view, the problem was that we were out of covenant with God. We were violating God's covenant. And that's caused the drought. And our practices agriculturally violated scripture as well. So we, the things that we were doing were compounding an existing issue and making it worse. Uh, so uh, man will always do the wrong diagnosis. I remember that Dr. Rushduni drew attention to historical research about things like the plague and cholera. And I think it was in, in respect to cholera, he pointed out the areas in Europe and in England and elsewhere 
where uh, it was said, well, cholera is going to be solved if we have good sanitation. The areas where cholera was not a problem wasn't the high sanitation areas where hygiene was good. It was where biblical morale was high, but the hygiene was horrible, but no cholera. And where the biblical morality was lacking, but they had the hygiene, there was the cholera. So right there, the technological solution was already failing. And what do men do? They kind of brush that evidence aside and say, well, that's a peculiarity, isn't it? How odd. Uh, but the reality is not odd. It's actually covenantal and it's baked into the creation. Creation responds when man does things in respect to it. And that's man's failure is his unwillingness to acknowledge that God is Lord and governor among the nations. And he deals with the agricultural. He deals with disease. Uh, our relationship with these things is based on our covenant with God. And therefore, uh, if the problem is technological, then you're going to start twisting dials and mixing chemicals and applying electrical fields, and trying to fix things that way when, in fact, it's the wrong solution, as Mark uh, pointed out at the very beginning. Bad diagnoses mean that the fixes, the cures, are at best symptomatic relief, if that, but the actual root cause remains. And that's why we stand in risk of having more dust bowls and more diseases like cholera that seem to predominate despite all our efforts to fight them. And that's because we're addressing them purely from a materialistic point of view, a technological point of view. And the universe is much deeper and richer than that. It's actually God's handiwork and shows forth his glory. And consequently, it reacts in a certain way when men violate God's covenant with respect to the earth. Yeah. So, Martin, following up on that, there seems to be an expectation, Rajduni calls it a myth, that human perfection is possible. As a result of this myth, how are men and cultures deceived into thinking that all will be made right? Um, we see, I see lots of commercials about the meta universe and how we're going to conquer all these diseases and all these um, challenges because we know we can get there because progress is inevitable. It's not inevitable, is it, if men are at war with God? Well, you already had the problem of a universe that's dying. Uh, on humanistic grounds. They say it's going to suffer a heat death. So what kind of longevity are you folks really talking about, you humanists? Uh, it is a false claim to begin with. And they basically will say, our problem is material being. We need to transcend our material uh, bodies, our physical bodies, and become something more like uh, um, spirits floating around or electrical signals inside silicon. So they're talking about uploading human minds into silicon so we can live forever until the, some, the batteries run out. <laughs> See, there's always a problem somewhere. Um, and you can always have this infinite regress in, in the system. So there's a form of Platonism or at least Neoplatonism that's coming about because you're talking about the, God, the man to come. There's even a book, what's it called? Uh, Homo uh, Deus or something like that by a, 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 a humanistic author of note who believes that we can essentially become godlike uh, through technology. Uh, and uh, and by godlike, we mean transcending material uh, nature that we have. Now, we know that God made us a, a composite of material and spirit together. Uh, my favorite phrase from Matthew Henry, men's a peculiar or strange creature, a ray of heaven united to a clod of dirt. And that's what we actually are. And it's kind of a miraculous thing that it, it works the way it does. But that's because God's the author of it, and that's what makes it so glorious. What they see is that this is some kind of horrible back uh, water of evolution that needs to be corrected by man taking charge of his own evolution. So it's not uh, mindlessly moving to some direction, but is guided to what the Neoplatonists want, which is transcending the material realm entirely. That way, uh, man becomes something much bigger than himself. He becomes godlike, like that book title, Homo Deus. That's a, a big popular book. Uh, and why is it popular? Because people want to become God. You know, the whole premise of Genesis 3, 5 lives in this book title, uh, and it's going to continue to live in the hearts of everyone who is estranged from God and alienated from the covenants of promise. Uh, and because they are, they have to build their own promises up. And these are based on technology. Technology will help us transcend. We can uh, change how long a telomere 
uh, on our chromosomes and what have you will will last so that we can live longer and pay, perhaps get us over the hump till the point we can be uploaded into the universal mind, if you will, or have robotic bodies that never wear out uh, because things do, in fact, wear out. Even the creation is not designed to last forever. Uh, it, it, there will be a renewing of it, a translation of the creation uh, in the future uh, where it will have that, but it's because God is the author of it and, and the the driving force uh, of the tree of life, if you will, that would make that possible. Men seek the tree of life in all sorts of false ways. And technology uh, is impressive if you are looking at it. Certain things seem to impress people. You say, look, we can build a bomb that can do this. We can put enough electricity in that we can do that. Uh, and we can move rivers and change their courses with this damming the rivers and et cetera. So man's technological achievements, you know, going to the moon, what have you, uh, whatever they might be, are used as uh, points that are laid down on the playing table saying this is what uh, God has been or man has been able to achieve. And this is just the beginning. But the entire, what, what has man achieved morally, that's a continual collapse. So, uh, yeah, the issue is going to persist because, again, wrong diagnosis, wrong solutions. I wonder if when we get absorbed into um, whatever this is and we become robots, will we then check the box that say, I am a robot? Now we have to check the box that says we're not a robot. Maybe we'll have to change our identity at that point. Well, you'll, anyway, be, able that tell, aside. you'll be able to tell which uh, signs have a stop sign or a vehicle or a tree in them. That's the one advantage you might have over a robot. There you go. Mark, do you think it's significant uh, in the modern church, most churches, that little to no attention is paid to the pronouncements of God in Deuteronomy 28? And he's pretty forthright. There's not a lot of fuzzy in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings or the cursings, yet it seems to be systematically ignored. Is this intentional or just bad training? Modern Christian church very often has a hard time dealing with the blessings and cursings that you're referring to. They have a hard time because they're not sure. There's a great uncertainty in the modern church as to whether God's word really applies the same way as it, it did when it was given. So they question in their theology and in their practice, whether we really actually have to obey God. So then, therefore, they question the, the blessings and the cursings. It leaves man basically to his own devices. And this is where you get basically a form of humanism. If we are not responsible to obey God, if we're not responsible to do things as God says, we're like children without parents. We have no direction, and we're going to get ourselves into trouble very quickly without supervision, without authority pointing us in the right direction. And so this is where the, the modern church is, and it's why the modern church doesn't really have a, a sufficient voice in our culture is because they question within themselves you know, what God has really said for us today. And they cloak it in a theology that seems to make sense. Uh, they cloak it in a theology that at times seems to be very respectful to God and appreciative to God, but they have lost the authority of God in their own thinking. Therefore, they don't have any real answer for where do we go from here. And this is why my father emphasized theonomy. This is the whole issue of theology. Theonomy. What is theonomy? It's God's word to man, and it's authoritative. And it's God's instructions for the redeemed as to where do we go from here? You know, Francis Schaeffer asked the right question. How then shall we live? Theonomy is really the answer because it tells us what we are to do and what we're not to do. And so when we reduce what the word of God in any way, we are reducing our understanding of where we should be heading and what our response should be. And we don't have good answers then. We're left 
with a tr- tremendous vag- vagueness, the same vagueness as many non-believers have about where do we go from here. And so the, the, the church has lost its voice to a large extent because of its theology. And so there has to be a revival in the church first. And an understanding of the church of where we ha- need to, to go and how we obey God before there's going to be a change. It's interesting in regard to Deuteronomy 28, as Dr. Rashtuni had often commented, that uh, when U.S. presidents would take the oath of office, it was on a Bible that was opened to that chapter. This was not a closed word. There was um, corporate knowledge of the significance of Deuteronomy 28 to the nation. And, of course, the time eventually came when presidents closed the Bible, uh, circa around the time of uh, FDR, if I'm not mistaken if not earlier, and it became a closed Bible even when Reagan took his oath of office. You know, here we, he proclaims a year of the Bible, and the one time he could actually do something positive, open the Bible to Deuteronomy 28 like it used to be done, he leaves it a closed book. And so it becomes a closed book for uh, the people as well. Like people like priests, we get the government that we deserve, and therefore the leaders, leaders political leaders, follow suit because Deuteronomy 28 was also closed by the church. So ultimately. Uh, the people follow after the declension, the decline of the whole counsel of God being preached from the pulpits uh, of America. And other nations fall in the same category. So there was a time when people could reason biblically, and that's been indoctrinated out of us. That's part of the intention of the public school systems, is to reason socialistically and not biblically. And we're uh, certainly uh, seeing the fruit of that in each subsequent generation. And the more they're detached from God, the more suicidal they become. Uh, because they, what are we here to live for? Uh, and that question used to have a very strong answer, uh, say, out of the uh, Westminster Short Catechism, the first question, where to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's quite a, a high goal to shoot for. Uh, it's a glorious one, and all are invited. Everyone can win this particular race, the race that uh, Paul talks about, you know, that he's running himself. But instead, no one's running that race. Uh, the race has been canceled uh, because uh, the human has said there's no one to race for. There's no goal at the end. It's a, it's a fraud. Christianity is a fraud. Uh, but it's actually humanism that's the true fraud because it's erected on the true li- actually the lies that this nature, this, this uh, country is building on. And that's why I think Isaiah 28 refers to the fact that men build this refuge of lies, but God will overflow the refuge of lies. He'll, he'll pour water in there, and they'll be essentially flooded out from that so-called safe haven of lives, of lies, of falsehoods that humanism has built American and, and uh, world culture upon. So you mentioned the idea of the first question in the chief end of man. I've recently heard it preached that the chief end of man is to be saved, <laughs> which of course really changes the dynamic but I was thinking of Martin Proverbs 8 3. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. Do you think people are conscious of the fact that any deviation from the law of God is a love of death? I don't think that's taught. Uh, you don't get that many sermons out of Proverbs to start with, unless it's something that uh, helps itching ears in certain respects. And uh, Proverbs 8 36, which you're appealing to. Uh, is a critical verse in so many regards. It's a Debbie Donner kind of verse for openers. Uh, it talks about the, uh, a love of death uh, and and what articulates it, what sets it in motion, uh, which is a hatred of, in this context, wisdom, but also wisdom personified. After all, the uh, Gospel of Luke talks about Jesus as the wisdom of God. Uh, he, he, is, he is wisdom incarnate, in effect. Um, so it is referring to God himself as well as wisdom. But hatred of wisdom and hatred of God both manifest a love of death. Uh, and what is it about death that's loving, that, that they love, is that it at least removes God from the picture and man can be himself. And that's, as Dr. Rashtuni points out, the whole point of hell is where God says to man, thy will be done, man's will be done. But that means that you're going to be spending eternity um, talking to yourself and ordering yourself around because that's going to be the extent of your alleged godhood. It's the it's it's dark and it's lonely because you're the only member 
of this cult of one that you've created. Uh, and humanism always tells everyone to build. What a shame. Uh, what, a, what a terrible waste it is. But the, And yet they, they don't want to hear it because at least they're in control of that, they think. They reason as uh, Lucifer reasons uh, in, in Paradise Lost, you know, better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. They could serve in heaven and be tremendously blessed eternally, but they'd rather rule in hell, even though it's a horrendous thing. But that's what the love of death is all about, to rule in hell. That's what the love of death is, is concerned. And what happens when enough people are of this mindset, they bring hell into the world. And the world was created a beautiful place. It was Everything was good, according to Genesis 131. Nothing was lacking, and a lot is lacking because... God made man upright, but men have sought out many devices, as we learn from the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's the way it's going to be until men change their direction, until they turn to God, and then God will in turn turn to them, and there will be covenantal faithfulness, and then we will see and enjoy the blessings that Deuteronomy 28 refers to. Right. So, Mark, this essay that dates back to 1973, your father quoted some amazing statistics. He obviously thought they were significant statistics in terms of suicide and suicide attempts. And we know that since 1973, um, the number has been magnified, especially where status tyranny prevails. Having the benefits of reading the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, why does the church not preach on these? It would seem that they would be the warning that says you don't want to repeat these mistakes of, of Israel, of Judah. Do you think it's intentional or do you think it's just, well, this doesn't apply anymore? Well, that, that's not easy why churches preach what they do and what they and why they don't preach. It comes down to their worldview, their understanding of scripture and its authority. And if you're not 100% sold on the idea that God's word is authoritative for us, then your preaching is going to be generalized. That you're just, and what the modern church often does with scripture and generally, particularly the Old Testament, is assuming that it was for a different people in a different era. You just look at it as as character lessons, you know, uh, be patient like Job, be bold like Gideon, or it looks at it in, in the sense of here's a, a lesson in obedience, uh, whatever that looks like today, they may not be able to, to see. And the wisdom of God is something that perplexes them because they, they haven't fully come to terms with who God is in their own thinking, I, I think. They're not even sure whether God is speaking to us today when he says, thou shalt or thou shalt not. So therefore, are his words of wisdom entirely valid? You see, when there's a vagueness in your theology about the word of God itself and its applicability, then you look for things that are going to, and messages that are going to be more understandable to you and to an audience that follows your your theology. So bad theology leads to bad preaching. Okay. So Martin, I'm now going to ask you a question which at first pass might seem like this is a weird question. But when you think about how theonomy is dismissed in so many areas within the church, what do you think people consider the sins that Jesus died for? Well, they would generally say it's unbelief is the uh, the main sin that he's he died for um, because they believe that if they hold that belief in Jesus saves. Therefore, the only reason not to go to heaven is a failure to believe in him. And uh, Christ has covered that uh, sin, but apparently people are not availing themselves of it. So, there's certainly been a range of opinions about how much of God's laws is applicable, if at all, today uh, among Christians. Uh, some will hold that the Ten Commandments, what they uh, classify as the moral law, is all that applies. Uh, 
others will simply hold to the two great commandments. And uh, now we've really entered the do domain of the general and the vague, as uh, Mark just alluded to. You love the Lord your God and love your neighbors yourself. Uh, and if that's not unpacked in some way or form, then it's up to you to come up with your best idea. And if you simply say, I have an emotional affection for God or my idea of God, and I have emotional affection for my neighbor, that's enough to get me to heaven. And uh, then, of course, we're in a world of hurt because um, that leaves 611 other commandments that we could theoretically be broken and uh, wreaking havoc uh, between our, in our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow men and our relationship with nature, with the creation, as it were. So why antinomianism? I think it appeals to people very simply. People want to be off the hook. If they're on the hook, that entails the R word, responsibility. But if we can say you're not responsible, you know, grace is an irresponsible uh, lifestyle choice in effect um, because God's going to let you slide. Greasy grace for that reason is uh, how it's been called. And if he lets it slide, then what we do down here is not nearly so important. We can get away with all sorts of things, kid, sticking our kids in public schools, uh, having just unjust weights and measures in our pockets, uh, having a massive uh, government that does all sorts of evil things um, inside the nation and outside toward other nations. All this can be, we can say, we get a pass for it. That's all under some other covenant, maybe like the Noe covenant. The new covenant is essentially rewritten as if it has nothing to do with the law of God, despite the fact that when Jeremiah presents it in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, he says the two distinctives about it are that God's going to write his law, the very law that Jeremiah knew very well, uh, on the hearts and minds of the people. So all those jots and tittles get written into our hearts and minds for spontaneous obedience. And that uh, no man will need to teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord, but they shall all know the Lord from the least to the greatest. So there'll be a generally uh, a very wide distribution of uh, saving knowledge of God as a consequence of, and we would say of the Great Commission and the pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh as predicted by Joel and reiterated in Acts 2. So there's a whole bunch of things are going on with the New Covenant, but if you suddenly uh, cut that passage open and say, no, 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 don't read law here, law of God uh, and commandments, this is not what Jeremiah is talking about. He's talking about some brand new law, the law of Christ, which is this very vague thing. And at that point, we're off the hook on all the other aspects of uh, the law of God. Uh, and the appeal of it is, I'm off the hook too. Uh, and I don't have to worry about all these things. And, and boy, what a surprise it's going to be when Matthew 5.19 is triggered at the end of the age. It basically tells us, whosoever shall loosen the, even the least of these commandments and teach men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall do and teach, as to be both, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So our standing in the kingdom of heaven is determined by our relationship, attitude toward God's law. And if that attitude is a negative one, if it's, it's a, uh, um, a negating one, then we are loosening the commandments of God, the jots and tittles that were just referred to in Matthew 5.18. Uh, and what's our standing? Least in the kingdom of heaven. And people are content to get the D minus and they say, okay, at least I pass. I didn't get the F, I got the D minus. And so we have all sorts of people who have very little to offer God in terms of their response to his wonderful works. And it's a tragedy for them because they had a whole lifetime to be fruitful for him. And instead, uh, they bore very, very little fruit uh, because they didn't know any better. And their pastors you know, gave them the smooth sounding words that justified them keeping the pew warm and keeping the tithe money flowing, but not actually altering their lifestyle to uh, align with what God required of them, what God called them to do, the great privileges that God called them to, the great blessings that he promised them for walking his way. Instead, they, they turned all of that off and said, I can lead my life my own way. Uh, and in essence, uh, by the loosening of God's commandments, we also loosen the blessings that go with them. And I think there's another passage which says the D minus isn't going to get you in. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. If that's not the law, I'm not sure where you're going to figure out God's will, because every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So do you think there are a lot of people, Martin, who are just deluded into thinking they have made peace with God as opposed to being at war with God? <laughs> 
There's an interesting passage in uh, both Luke and Matthew where Jesus calls the people, he's talking to the people, hypocrites for the following reason. He says, when you look at the sky, you see it's red and you can, you can draw conclusions about a storm coming or what kind of weather's coming up. Uh, you can d- discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, what triggered this response to him calling them hypocrites? Because God gave them discernment to deter- see these things and draw their own conclusion. But when it came to the works of Jesus, instead of using their own mind that God gave them the blessing of an intelligence for, and to seeing that this is the hand of the Messiah, clearly, this is God's finger at work, and they ran to their leaders and said, what does this mean? And Jesus said, this act of asking the past, the leaders, the spiritual leaders, with the significance of what Christ was doing, an act of hypocrisy. He says, God fully equipped you to make your own decision. Instead, you foist the decision off on your leaders. And today, the same phenomenon occurs. People say, well, the pastor said, or the church's position is X, Y, or Z. And that is a substitute, alleged substitute, for doing your own thinking. But God denies us that. He calls this hypocrisy. You're supposed to look at the scripture yourself and determine for yourself. So you're on the hook to know this. You're on the hook to make your own decision as to these matters and not to say, I don't have to worry about it. My pastor told me not to worry. I trust him. Well, we talked about this on the last podcast you and I did together, Andrea, that the trust in man is a curse. Curse is the man who trusts in man who makes flesh his arm. Uh, We're supposed to trust in God in his word and not in man and man's word. So, so many times the scriptures warned us about being led astray by blind guides. In this respect, a whole area of scripture, five whole books of the Bible, are set aside as no longer applicable. I would think that you'd have to have some extraordinary evidence for such an extraordinary act of subtracting from scripture. But they don't need it. They have all these quick answers saying, well, the pastor said, and it says this in the Schofield Bible, it must be true. And so all these um, tricks of the trade are deployed in order to make God's word inapplicable, to take that double-edged sword and make it a very soft edge that doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't change your life, and allows you to cruise the way you're doing it. And that is going to be the pathway to death. Because instead of getting the narrow path that leads to life, you get the wide, easy path that leads to destruction in many cases, and the fact that we, and that's why Jesus warned about false leaders. Uh, if anything was clear, it's this. And earlier you have talked about, what about these pastors? What does the scripture say? Well, Isaiah and Jeremiah and others said, these particular pastors are like guard dogs that fail to bark. They are not warning the flock. They're not warning Israel about the spiritual dangers that are coming upon them for their disbelief and their sin and their transgressions not being warned about these things. Uh, and consequently, the curses will stay on them and on their leaders. So the, a leader or a pastor who is not warning the flock about their conduct is useless in Scripture. They are not fit. And that's why there's three whole chapters talking about bad shepherds. Zechariah 11, Jeremiah 23, and Ezekiel 34, which is quoted by Jesus in John 10. So it's not as if it's just just Old Testament. Jesus brings Ezekiel 34 to life in respect to himself, being the good shepherd, uh, in contrast to the bad ones. So we should be listening to the good shepherd on all of these things and not to the human pastors, especially if we have itching ears. We have itching ears. We're going to accumulate for ourselves teachers to suit our own likings. We should be accumulating for ourselves teachers who are faithful to the word of God, and especially if we don't like to hear it. That means we definitely need to hear it. Because our, our inclination is to be uh, set aside God's word and do things our own way, to be like the sheep lost on doing his own will and instead of doing God's will. And so anyone who's justifying us doing our own will is not a good shepherd, not a good watchdog, not warning us, not barking. They're sleeping dogs. And not only that, they're hungry dogs. They consume a lot. <laughs> and, and you don't get any value out of these pastors and these leaders. And I think that's a concern because what is happening when you have a populace that has itching ears, then a lot of the worst pastors get funded wonderfully. And the ones that are actually faithful to the word of God find their flocks fairly small, but dedicated. And I think God's going to use the faithful ones in order to transform uh, the world. Uh, it, that's the way it's going to be. Gideon's army was not going to be as big as he planned, but it was going to be more effective than he planned. Right. Okay, Mark, I'll let you wrap up our time here. 
with just the closing remarks your father gave in this essay. Suicidal humanism doesn't sound like a happy kind of message. However, he points out that while all the technocrats and they're all planning for this this progress that we know will fail, there was a new power growing. Talk a little bit about this ignored group of people that uh, Martin sort of alluded to. Well, the the primary theme of Christ in the in his ministry that we see throughout the Gospels from its very beginning of our Lord's ministry until the crucifixion was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is this realm of which Christ is Lord and of which we are citizens. And we have a calling within that context of the kingdom of God. And we have a place, we have a duty, but the progress of the kingdom of God, the power is that of the spirit of God. And God has said, this is going to grow. It's going to fill the earth. And you are part of that. And as I've said many times, we aren't called to figure out how all this is going to happen. We're only called to be faithful in that tiny sliver of responsibility that's set before us. And so if we know Christ is going to be successful, if we know that he has not been taken from his uh, throne, if we know that his rule is certain and it's going to expand in history, then we can live a very confident life. Men are suicidal. Men, when they rebel against God, are never going to be successful. And so we have this confidence. And I think it's a very faulty theology that leads people to look at the world around them and be discouraged to, and to think in any way that the kingdom of God is being frustrated. Man is working out the absurdities of his unbelief. But those absurdities are going to crumble, just as the Roman Empire crumbled. Think of all the opposition that Christ had. He had the opposition of Rome itself, as did the apostles. He had the opposition of the religious leadership of Israel that was firmly entrenched and put him to death. And yet his kingdom continues to grow, and they're only a matter of historical records today. So. We have every reason to be optimistic, not necessarily about the future a year or two years from now, or perhaps even within our lifetimes, but that we're on the winning side in time and eternity. And that is the confidence that should propel us, that the Holy Spirit is not going to be frustrated in the advance of the kingdom. And so the people of God have a great calling. And he made it easy for us because he said, it's going to win. <laughs> and so because we know we're on the winning side, we've we've cheated and we've read the, the last chapter of history. And we can see this coming and we can act in that certainty. So to be discouraged about the cause of Christ in any way reveals a lack of understanding about what God has told us about his work in history. Very good. Well, listeners, you can find this essay and others like it in the three-volume set, Faith in Action, and you can purchase that at calcedonstore.com. And I'd encourage you to get it. It's a great volume, or three volumes, I should say, that are um, very systematically indexed and You'd be hard-pressed not to find a topic that you have a question about that Dr. Rush Dooney didn't cover there. And so, gentlemen, thank you for um, our discussion tonight. Listeners, we look forward to you joining us next time.